verlangen, dass ein unmöglicher Zustand auf dem Weg von friedlichen Revisionen bereinigt wird, um die friedlichen Revisionen konsequent zu verweigern. After its defeat in the First World War, Germany was forbidden to have an air force, tanks or submarines. A strict limit was imposed on the size of its army. When he came to power in 1933, Adolf Hitler swept aside these military restrictions. He also violated the territorial restrictions that had been imposed. In March 1936, he sent troops into that part of Germany west of the Rhine, which the League of Nations, created in 1919 to keep the peace and settle disputes, had decreed that no troops of any country should occupy. In March 1938, he engulfed Austria on the pretext of restoring order. Then he took a bite out of Czechoslovakia. The weakness of the League of Nations and uncertainty about what to do in the face of aggression led to the now infamous act of appeasement at Munich in September 1938. The British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, returned from having signed that agreement, speaking of peace in our time. Six months later, Hitler devoured the rest of Czechoslovakia. It was clear that the state of Poland, recreated after the 1914-18 conflict, would be Germany's next victim. Hitler was demanding the reunification of the port of Danzig with the Reich. In an attempt to save the Poles, Great Britain and France promised to come to their aid if they were attacked. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. On Sunday, September the 3rd, Chamberlain spoke to the British people. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The British government anticipated an immediate blitzkrieg, even invasion. Within eight minutes of Chamberlain's declaration, the air raid sirens began to wail, and it seemed that the worst had happened. But it was a false alarm. Britain carried on with its preparations. Closing of places of entertainment. All cinemas, theatres and other places of entertainment are to be closed immediately until further notice. The evacuation of British children is going on smoothly and efficiently. The Ministry of Health says that great progress has been made with the first part of the government's arrangements. The railways, the road transport organisations, the local authorities and teachers the voluntary workers, and not least, the householders in the reception areas, are all playing their parts splendidly. We're on number 12 platform at Waterloo Station, one of the ten big metropolitan stations that are engaged today on the evacuation of London's school children. We're on number 12 platform, the train's in, and the children are just arriving, coming along in their school group, with a banner in front saying what school they are. This lot from John's School, Walworth, which is south of the river, and then they follow behind. The tiny tots in front, leading up to the bigger ones, the 12, 13 year olds behind, and here comes the high school, more like 14, 15 and 16. They're being evacuated too. A million and a half people, the vast majority of them children, were evacuated from the danger zones in London and the other big cities. For many, evacuation brought great unhappiness. By January 1940, 900,000 had gone home again. Some 14,000 children were sent to safety in America and the Dominions. Princess Elizabeth, aged 14, spoke to them, as well as to the children of Britain, when she made her first broadcast on Children's Hour. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes 
and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. To you living in new surroundings, we send a message of true sympathy. And at the same time, we would like to thank the kind people who have welcomed you to their homes in the country. Evacuation overseas came to a tragic end when the liner City of Benares was torpedoed in September 1940. 73 children lost their lives. The British Expeditionary Force, which sailed for France in September 1939, expected to go straight into battle. Instead, it found itself kicking its heels in one of the worst winters on record. The seven months of what became known as the Phony War had begun. Richard Dimbleby, the BBC's first war correspondent who accompanied the BEF, was able to provide colour, but not much in the way of content. We're standing in the pouring rain at the side of a French road a road squelching with mud and lined right away over the plain to the far skyline with the inevitable double row of poplars. It's a grey, cold, dismal day. A few lorries only are splashing by to and from the forward areas. But coming down the road towards us is a battalion that I know to be of a famous Irish regiment. They're marching in threes, and in their full battle dress and kit, they blend with the dripping green grass of the roadside and the brown of the haystack. As they passed us on that road, with their brown capes glistening and their tin hats perched on their heads, I thought how similar this must be to pictures of the last war. The road, the trees, the rain, and the everlasting beat of feet. At home on Armistice Day, regularly observed since the end of the First World War, the Queen spoke to the women of the Empire. War has at all times called for the fortitude of women. Even in other days, when it was an affair of the fighting forces only, wives and mothers at home suffered constant anxiety for their dear ones, and too often the misery of bereavement. Their lot was all the harder because they felt that they could do so little beyond heartening through their own courage and devotion, the men at the front. Now this is all changed, for we, no less than men, have real and vital work to do. The fear of gas attack led the government to issue some 40 million gas masks and to urge citizens to carry them everywhere. What we're going on with this morning is the use of the respirator and a gas attack. Now, the first thing you would do is you'd hold your breath. The reason being, if you didn't hold your breath, you'd breathe in, uh, breathe in the poison gas and you'd be gas. Carrying gas masks was a habit that rapidly declined. It ended completely in 1942 when the government ceased its campaign, principally because of the need to save rubber. What action there was was happening at sea. The passenger liner Athenia was torpedoed in the Irish Sea with the loss of 128 lives. The aircraft carrier Courageous was sunk by a U-boat in the Bristol Channel and another put paid to the battleship Royal Oak at Scupper Flow. But the Royal Navy produced the first good news of the war when the German pocket battleship Graf Spee, which in two months had sunk nine merchantmen in the South Atlantic, was so damaged that its captain scuttled her off the coast of Uruguay. Winston Churchill, as First Lord of the Admiralty, made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, the news which has come from Montevideo has been received with thankfulness in our island and with unconcealed satisfaction throughout the greater part of the world. The pocket battleship, Graf Spee, which has been for many weeks preying upon the trade of the South Atlantic, has met her doom. And throughout a vast expanse of water, the peaceful shipping of all nations 
may, for a spell at least, enjoy the freedom of the seas. When the crews of the triumphant British warships marched through London, they received a hero's welcome. With the spring of 1940, the phony war ended abruptly. It was about dawn this morning that the first reports came in saying that German troops were crossing the frontier into Denmark. At the same time, attacks were being delivered from the sea on a number of Norway's biggest ports. The Oslo radio is still working and has announced that German troops have disembarked at Egersund on the south coast of Norway and that Christian Sand has been attacked and also bombed. Denmark was occupied in a single day. Norway, which saw the first offensive airborne operation of the war and the first amphibious landing, was taken, but not without heavy German losses at sea inflicted by the Royal Navy. British and French troops came to Norway's aid, but after some initial success, were driven out. Over-optimistic reports in Britain had led the nation to expect a different outcome. Chamberlain no longer had popular support, and, as the American commentator Ed Murrow reported, he no longer had the confidence of Parliament. This is London. I spent today in the House of Commons. The debate was opened by Herbert Morrison, one of the ablest members of the Labour Party. He doubted that the government was taking the war seriously. Mr. Morrison said that the Labour Party had decided to divide the House. In other words, call for a vote. Mr. Chamberlain, white with anger, intervened in the debate and accepted the challenge. In fact, he welcomed it. He fairly spat the words. He said that he had friends in the House, and he appealed to them to support him. When he had finished, Mr. David Lloyd George rose and placed his notes upon the dispatch box, and members surged into the room through both doors as though the little, square, grey-shouldered, white-haired Welshman were a magnet to draw them back to their seats. He swept the house with his arm and said, if there is a man here who is satisfied with our production of planes, of guns, of tanks, or the training of troops, let him stand on his feet. No one stood. Chamberlain had no option but to stand down. I sought an audience of the king this evening and tendered to him my resignation which His Majesty has been pleased to accept. His Majesty has now entrusted to my friend and colleague, Mr. Winston Churchill, the task of forming a new administration on a national basis. And in this task, I have no doubt he will be successful. On the very day that Churchill took office, the invasion of Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg began. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a short news bulletin. The German army invaded Holland and Belgium early this morning by land and by landings from parachutes. The armies of the Low Countries are resisting. An appeal for help has been made to the Allied governments and Brussels says that Allied troops are moving to their support. German paratroops seized vital Dutch bridges and airfields. The major Belgian fort of Eben Emile fell to glider troops and the Belgian army retreated. Allied Commander-in-Chief Gamelin ordered mobile units of the French army and the British Expeditionary Force to the Belgians' assistance. BBC correspondent Bernard Stubbs watched the BEF advance. Here, standing on the Franco-Belgian frontier, we're watching long columns of British troops and transports and supplies and guns coming through from France into Belgium. Just on this frontier, there's a little village which is presumably half French and half Belgian since it stretches on both sides. And almost the entire village has turned out and seems to be standing in the street all day long watching these transports coming up. The welcome given by the Belgian people is really tremendous. But the enthusiasm of the people in this part of Belgium makes a sharp contrast with the sufferings of the refugees from such places as Liège. We saw several lorry loads of these unhappy people, and at one point on another road, we met a straggling little party of Belgians, old men and women and children, and some of them with rolled blankets tied over their shoulders, their few pathetic belongings strapped on their back or carried in cheap suitcases in their hands. For a time, as Charles Gardner reported, the Allies held up the German occupation north of Antwerp. This roughly was the position when the British squadron was ordered to the attack. 
a French force was falling back to the lines of defense northeast of Antwerp, and they were engaged in a race with an advanced German motorized column which was rushing round to try and cut them off. It seemed possible that the Germans might manage it, and so the order went out, hold up that German column. The Germans have been bombing again today, uh, mainly roads and aerodromes and refugees. And in one village, they hit a hospital, killing and injuring a number of people. Their latest trick, one which goes on top of bombing and shooting the ever-increasing stream of refugees, is to machine gun the cattle in the French fields, and lots of these have been seen lying about dead. Then the panzers smashed through the Ardennes, considered certainly by the French commanders to be untankable, and across the Meuse River, supported by dive bombers. The static defences of the vaunted Maginot Line were rendered futile. The Germans drove deep into France. On May the 14th, the Netherlands gave in. Having disposed of the French 9th Army by the following day, the German armour drove northwards towards the coast, cutting off the Allies' retreat. Churchill made his first broadcast as Prime Minister on May the 19th. Having received His Majesty's commission, I have formed an administration of men and women of every party and of almost every point of view. We have differed and quarrelled in the past, but now one bond unites us all, to wage war until victory is won, and never to surrender ourselves to servitude and shame, whatever the cost and the agony may be. There were fresh fears of invasion, fuelled by the success of the Germans' airborne tactics. Sir Anthony Eden, Secretary of State for War, called for men to enrol in a new voluntary force, which was not yet called the Home Guard. I want to speak to you tonight about the form of warfare which the Germans have been employing so extensively against Holland and Belgium, namely the dropping of troops by parachute behind the main defensive lines. Since the war began, the government have received countless inquiries from all over the kingdom, from men of all ages who are, for one reason or another, not at present engaged in military service, and who wish to do something for the defence of their country. Well, now is your opportunity. We want large numbers of such men in Great Britain who are British subjects between the ages, ages of 17 and 65. 17 and 65, to come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance doubly sure. The name of the new force, which is now to be raised, will be the Local Defence Volunteers. 